Welcome to Mozilla. It's lovely to have you. It's lovely to see this space bustling um, with conversation already and look forward to this evening's program. I'm Ashley Boyd. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy for Mozilla. And probably many of you think of Mozilla by our famous browser, Firefox. Stay tuned next week. We'll have a new version of that, so we expect all of you to <laughs> download it. But many of you may not know that Mozilla is owned by a nonprofit, the Mozilla Foundation. And that's something we're really proud of. And in fact, we're guided by a manifesto. I joke that I always wanted to work for an organization that had a manifesto. So finally, I have one. And the manifesto includes a number of fantastic, important principles. And if you haven't looked at it um, before or, at all, or lately, I encourage you to do so. The second principle is really very um, relevant for tonight's discussion. It says, the internet is a global public resource that must remain open and accessible. And I feel like that principle, like all of them really, is sort of deceptively simple. We know in practice that that doesn't just happen on its own. It requires real stewardship and attention. And in these times, we see places around the world where freedom of expression is under threat on an individual or systemic level. Online harassment, hate speech, fake news, censorship, and even violence are some of the biggest threats um, to our internet and some of the most important internet policy issues of our day. And for that reason, we're really excited to join our friends with Wikimedia Foundation and International Justice Resource Center to welcome one of the world's foremost experts on free expression, David Kay, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. So thanks so much for joining us. And I will hand um, the introductions over to Jan from Wikimedia to continue this. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, and thanks to Mozilla for hosting us tonight. Um, my name is Jan Gerlach. I'm a public policy manager at the Wikimedia Foundation. We are the people who these days are sending you an email about uh, maybe donating um, and supporting free knowledge. Um, Wikipedia, we have a new version every second. Um, so um, maybe don't go download it, but go visit it. Um, sorry, it was such a good segue. Um, and, well, I really don't have anything to add there. Um, the open internet, freedom of expression, it's all under attack, as we um, like to say every day. Um, and um, with this series, Free Open Shared, a series of conversations around collaboration, policy, and knowledge, we want to raise awareness for uh, things that are going on on the web um, in knowledge um, and in policy, as the name says. Um, we kicked this off about a year ago, and this is the first time that we're actually off-site, not in our own office. So thank you so much for hosting us tonight. And uh, we're really happy um, to have David Kay here and to be co-hosting him with, also with the International Justice Resource Center. And here to introduce uh, David a little further to you is Sid Lally. Hi hey everyone, good night. Um, my name is Sitlali Ochoa. I'm a staff attorney at the International Justice Resource Center. We're an SF-based international human rights organization that works with advocates here and around the world providing informational resources, trainings, and technical support. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce David Kay, UN Special Repertoire, and also my former professor at UC Irvine School of Law. Um, he is not only a great professor, but also a huge advocate for freedom of expression. His work has included reports on encryption and anonymity, whistleblowers and sources, contemporary challenges to freedom of expression in the digital age, which is very relevant to our discussion tonight, and is currently working on a study of content regulation in the digital age. So without further ado, David King. Thanks everybody for coming. I, the last time I spoke was actually at the Foreign Correspondence Club in Bangkok and they have a big bar in the back. So it seemed to go well. So if you need a drink, 
I really don't mind if you get up and get a drink. Um, it's all on Yochai tonight. Um, I want to thank, <laughs> thank Mozilla, thank Wikimedia, thank IJRC for, uh, for hosting tonight's event. Um, I'm going to try to, I hope that I won't talk for too long. This picture here, I think, symbolizes, or at least um, yesterday symbolized how I felt about the internet. Um, I mean, I, I was saying to a couple of people, I don't know if you saw this story uh, in the Times, the New York Times, uh, on, on Sunday about YouTube kids and the channel and how, you know, some pretty obviously disturbing content uh, was getting through filters. And for whatever reason, after I read that, I just felt a little bit overwhelmed. I mean, I, I felt really that um, the issues that we're facing, because that was just one more issue um, in, in kind of the drip, drip, drip of other issues we see in which uh, there are negative stories about what's happening in digital space. Um, and even if that story didn't quite get at the truth, I think the emerging narrative about the internet is that it's a dark space and that even though in order to write that story, the journalist probably had to use the internet <laughs> quite a lot, the stories that we're seeing by and large are about um, how digital space is a place of threat to civil society, it's a place of censorship, uh, and it's a place of deep concern for, for parents, for minorities, for journalists, you name it. So, I, you know, on, on, on the one hand, in the next maybe 30 minutes of, of talking, and, and people should feel free to, as I said, get a drink or interrupt me uh, with a, either a heckle or a question during this, um, I hope to try to do a few things. So one is to give us all a framework to think about uh, internet issues or digital age issues, and the framework is a human rights law framework. I'm guessing that most, if not everyone in the, in the room, knows what that framework looks like, but I'll go back to it just to give us all a reminder, in part because my mandate is rooted in human rights law. It's not rooted in First Amendment law. And, and I think that actually human rights law offers us a lot in terms of how we could think about some of the issues we're dealing with today. After that, I'm going to kind of go through a, an awful catalog of um, censorship in the digital age, none of which really looks all that pretty. Um, I'll do that, um, and then at the end, I'll kind of ask, uh, you know, how do we think about this? What are the things that we might do going forward uh, in order to improve the situation? If, even if they're really asking whether there is room, uh, there's certainly room to improve, but how do we do that? So. Um, let me start with the framework. So everybody should know Article 19, uh, not just the organization based in London, which is a great organization, but the actual article in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR to which the United States is a party, uh, and something like 163 uh, states are parties to. It is, I think it's the shared vocabulary for thinking about freedom of expression worldwide. Uh, when, when you go to Europe, uh, where the European Convention is governing, it's very similar to Article 19. When you go anywhere else around the world, they don't care that Congress shall make no law. They care that everyone shall have these rights. And so just to go through them very quickly, everyone shall have the right to hold opinions. I think the key here uh, for, most of, um, for most of my work is this particular part, right? So if you think about it in contrast to the First Amendment, which is which says Congress shall right, make no law. It's focused on the institution. Human rights law is flipped around, right? And it's about our rights, right? It's not about just whether governments can do X, Y, or Z. It's about everyone having the right to freedom of expression, which is the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, through any media. I, I mean, I say this all the time. But this is language that's written for the digital age, right? The regardless of frontiers through any media, it really gives us open space to think about what we as individuals have a right to, seeking, receiving, imparting information. You could think of it in internet terms, uh, browsing, searching, 
um, posting, right? It's the language of, of the digital age. Now, paragraph three, usually I try to go over paragraph three fairly quickly. <laughs> paragraph three is where we see the restrictions that states uh, may impose on freedom of expression. And footnote, this only applies to freedom of expression. It doesn't apply to, uh, to paragraph one, which is opinion, right? Opinion cannot be restricted in any way. Maybe later we could talk about what that actually might mean. There's not a lot of law around that in particular. But Article 19.3 says that states can restrict as long as they meet three conditions, right? So one, the, the restriction has to be provided by law, which typically means it can't be a law that provides uh, li limitless discretion in the executive branch, for example, or law enforcement to impose restrictions. And the restrictions must be necessary. We read that as necessary and proportionate in order to achieve one of these three specific uh, objectives, respect of the rights or reputations of others, protection of national security or public order, or of public health or morals. Okay, so this is the framework that I want us to be thinking about um, as we think about what, um, what restrictions are possible and lawful in a digital age. Now, one other article is worth mentioning. You know, it's very common for us to, to say, or for me to say, you know, there's, there's literally no such thing really as hate speech as a matter of law. But actually, Article 20, in particular, Paragraph 2, focuses on issues around hate speech. Um, and it says, advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited by law. So states are under an obligation to prohibit this kind of advocacy. I think the key thing is that it's not enough to say that hate speech should be regulated, so hate speech on national, racial, or religious grounds, but it has to be advocacy that constitutes incitement. What is incitement to discrimination or hostility? Um, Maybe difficult for us to, uh, uh, to really define, but it's certainly clear in the context of incitement to, to violence. Okay, so before we get into, um, into digital age, let me just say a few words about censorship generally. And I'm gonna use censorship, small c, um, really as tantamount to an interference with the freedom of expression. I just wanted one word to, to actually say that. Um, it won't be, it won't work all in every example here, but generally I, I want us to be thinking of restrictions on freedom of expression in digital and physical space. So online and off, in many respects, don't vary from how censorship has always been, right? So if you take a look, for example, at, um, at Thailand, and this is just from a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months ago, where, um, there was a story in the New York Times about the sagging economy uh, in Thailand, which appeared online, but when it went to print, uh, Thai authorities demanded that the Times not print that particular story. So the Times uh, printed the, um, the issue of the paper that day and just left that entirely blank. That's, I mean, that's just regular old censorship. It doesn't look a lot different than, than what we've seen before. I'm, I'm gonna pick on Thailand once, <laughs> once again, because attacks on journalists, which are rampant uh, and, and awful, we've seen at least 30 journalists killed for being journalists this year alone. Um, attacks on journalists have, have continued, again, online and offline. And here, the, the Thai leader said, just soon after he, um, soon after the coup, really, um, he said, in response to a question about whether the government would do anything about journalists who report negatively about the coup, he said we'd probably just execute them. He doesn't have a real sense of humor, apparently, so this was taken pretty seriously as it should. Other areas, sedition. Around the world, this is Zunar, a cartoonist in Malaysia. Uh, he's under a travel ban and faces uh, a, a, a trial that could lead to over a dozen years in prison. Uh, Zunar, whose cartoons are really sharp, um, is charged with sedition for the content of his, of his art, really. I, we also see criminalization of false information. I'm not going to go through, the, this is way too much text for, for a slide, but just, just know, just take a 
from me or taken on my word, that around the world we're seeing laws, as we've seen for decades, that criminalize the dissemination of false information. I'll come back to this when we're thinking a little bit about false information and fake news, um, but these kinds of laws have been on the books for, for many years in many places. One of, I think, the worst things, and this is something that's been kind of percolating up for, for many years, is the redefinition of journalism and the redefinition of dissent and criticism as terrorism. Uh, this is Asla Erdogan and Nechmi Alpay, two writers, really important intellectuals in Turkey. They have been charged. Uh, they were in prison. They're now out on bail awaiting trial. They've been charged uh, with membership of uh, an armed terrorist organization, disrupting the unity and territorial integrity of the state, um, making propaganda for a terrorist organization. Why? Because they were involved in, um, in a foundation, essentially, that supported Osgur Gundem, which is a Kurdish newspaper in the southeast of Turkey. So they are being charged and face um, life in prison charges uh, in, in Turkey for their work as journalists, as intellectuals, but they've been redefined as terrorists. Okay, so that, that is all happening in offline space, and what we're seeing is that's moved into online space as well. There's, you know, the Human Rights Council, which is, you know, the central human rights body of the General Assembly, central human rights body of the UN, um, which appointed, appointed me to this position and has appointed another 50, 52 uh, special procedure positions, um, has said for quite a number of years now that uh, offline rights apply online as well. Well, unfortunately, the flip of that is, is the same, which is that offline repression is happening online as well. So, so now I want to just talk a little bit about places, and I think a lot of this will not be new to, to, to you in this room, um, but I want to talk about different ways in which we see censorship, perhaps having a little bit of a changed face uh, when we're talking about online censorship. So one is the scale, right? So it's possible now, you know, if we're talking about, for example, the Great Firewall of China, which we call, which is, you know, China's ability to restrict the ability of its citizens or anybody in the country from accessing websites around the world. This, I just tested this yesterday. I mean, you don't need to have an advanced degree to know that Facebook isn't accessible in China, but this is the kind of scale that, that the digital age has allowed, right? In the past, of course, um, we've had, you know, blockings and jamming of, um, of broadcast and other forms of media. This takes it, I think, to another level. We see internet shutdowns. A little shout out to Access Now, right here, which has been really a leading organization in pushing for, um, for activists, for journalists, for governments to recognize that we're in the middle of really an epidemic of internet shutdowns, where governments will force telcos and ISPs uh, to shut down the internet for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it will be for reasons having to do with national exams, so they don't want any cheating. Sometimes, and more likely, it's in the context of national protests or regional protests where for example, if you're in Kashmir, for the last 18 months or so, you know, you've been extremely lucky if you've been able to get online because India is bringing down the internet at, um, at a very, on a very regular basis. So this again, this is censorship at scale. And keep in mind, when, when we're talking about either blocking, like with the firewall and the sort of the mass filtering, or we're talking about shutdowns, uh, of the internet, we're also talking about shutdowns of mobile communication. We're talking about shutting down not just access to particular information, but the ability uh, for people to communicate with one another. Human Rights Council actually stepped in here and said, it condemns unequivoc unequivocally measures to prevent or disrupt access to or dissemination of information online, et cetera. It's not having much of an impact though, right? We're still seeing a, a real uptick in internet, um, internet censorship. Now, we're also seeing, now this is, uh, I think, something that's obviously offline, and that is state propaganda. And again, I'll come back to this a little bit in talking about false information and fake news, but of course, 
uh, at scale the ability for states to propagate information that is either misinformation or propaganda is pretty substantial. And so I think we can tie this back also to, to sort of the non-internet, non-digital forms of, uh, of censorship. Another set of problems, surveillance and insecurity, right? So one problem that I think is very clear, of course, after the Snowden revelations, we were quite familiar with the level of um, of surveillance that takes place in the context of Five Eyes, right? Of the developed world's ability to have access to all of our communications. The, there's also a kind of democratization of repression, and that is the ability for essentially Western companies to sell their surveillance um, spyware, right? Their, their technology. And this is really just a handful of governments around the world that are using that kind of technology in order to interfere with the expression of individuals. Now, you could say, well, this is really about interference with privacy, right? That's what surveillance fundamentally is about, getting into your private lives. But of course, our ability to express ourselves, our willingness to express ourselves depends on having a kind of private space and security in order to do that. And we see that also in the context of states around the world undermining encryption uh, and anonymity tools. So over time, while you know, the digital age has offered us so much access to information and so much possibility of connection, with surveillance, with other forms of censorship, we've also seen the dark side of, of how that works. And of course, there's also things like DDoS attacks, which you know, hit all individuals, but especially hit civil society pretty hard. One of my earlier slides identified uh, work from Citizen Lab. Citizen Lab has done a lot of really important work based um, looking at how, um, how civil society organizations, human rights activists, are particular targets of, um, of that kind of uh, digital attack. Now, that was kind of looking at scale. Um, also, censorship now is very targeted, and digital space makes that kind of easy. I would encourage people to look at Twitter's most recent transparency report, because it's really useful in showing the extent to which states, governments, are seeking access to uh, information, but also are seeking to take down specific content. So if you look at the removal requests, between January and the end of June of this year, I sort of organized this, which the, the transparency report allows you to do, according to the number of, um, of removal requests. And you can see here that the first column talks about removal requests by court order, Turkey, 715. Um, removal requests by government agency, police, or other almost 2,000 from Turkey, and you can go down the list and see the others as to how governments are going to companies and asking them uh, to remove content, to take down accounts, and so forth. Now, that, that's understandable, right? Because the companies operate in the context of local law, and their ability to operate may depend on whether they actually adhere to local law. But in addition to these kinds of removal requests, which you know, are, are generally focused on perceived or alleged violations of local law, governments are also demanding that the services, the platforms, remove content that is inconsistent with the terms of service. So you could imagine situations where the government itself has no legal authority to take down particular content under its own law. Right, maybe because it adheres to, um, to human rights law. So in those kinds of situations, they may go directly to the companies and say, we see violations of your terms of service here, abusive behavior, promotion of terrorism, where you'll see the percentage of accounts actioned was 92%. Um, where I'm guessing that there's some over-regulation going on, going on there because, because terrorism. Um, so I think as we think about the kind of targeted uh, censorship that we're seeing in, in digital space, it's not just because governments are saying you must adhere to local law. It's also governments saying to the platforms, 
you must adhere to your own terms of service, or we're going to push you to adhere to your terms of service. Okay, so for the last set of, um, of issues, I think these are, uh, in a way, the, the hard issues today, and I think we're still at an early stage of understanding the impact of private content regulation uh, on, on digital space. Um, certainly, I think we're at a very speculative place in terms of, one, of understanding how the company's own community standards and terms of service may actually have some influence on how we think or how our publics think about freedom of expression. So I just want to identify a few different uh, questions here. So one is, I mean, obviously everybody um, remembers because it's come up as an issue again. Um, I mean, it's been with us since a year ago in the election of, of Donald Trump. Um, but you'll remember right after his election, there was a kind of initial freak out about fake news. And I, I found this really interesting in this uh, uh, editorial from the editorial board of the Times, you know, basically putting all of the onus on the platforms to regulate. And there's, there's good reason for the platforms to be monitoring this space and perhaps to be doing more than, they're, than they've done up to this time. But I thought this was a, a particular um, statement of, that showed the pressure that I think is going to be um, increasing. I mean, I think if we think about the last week and some of the platforms being up on Capitol Hill, um, I think that's only the beginning. Um, and here, surely, it's, this is the, at the time saying, surely its programmers, speaking of Facebook, can train the software to spot bogus stories and outwit the people producing this garbage. You know, just some sort of magic technology dust and the problem ends. But it's obviously not that easy, right? Because there's problems of over-regulation. There's problems of, remember, around the world, com um, countries are criminalizing the dissemination of false news. So this kind of attitude, which obviously at some level is real, right? It's important that companies deal with this problem, but it's also going to feed into, I fear, the repression um, and, well, the repression that often hits journalists and others who are simply sharing information. I think we don't yet know the extent to which um, the policies, the community standards, the terms of service of the companies are actually having an impact on freedom of expression. I think at a, at a minimum, the companies need to be transparent about how their policies operate. Uh, if anything, so that we can understand how much censorship is actually out there, how much regulation is taking place on platforms. Now, whether human rights law you know, as a matter of law, actually applies to the restrictions that the companies uh, impose on their own platforms is, is one question. I mean, I think the, the clear answer is human rights law doesn't on its own apply to the platforms. But the extent to which the platforms should be applying standards that are rooted in protecting individuals' rights to freedom of expression, I think is an important conversation for us to be having, and that it's not a conversation that should, ha should happen only in the context of, of sort of the crisis of the moment, right? A couple other, I think, looming threats that are out there. One is the right to be forgotten. And I think this points to something that I think the, um, the platforms in particular should be very alive to. And that is, Congress is probably not going to do all that much. I mean, when, when has it done all that much? So, you know, we can be afraid of some of the rhetoric coming out of, uh, coming out of Congress right now, but, the, you know, how much they'll actually do, um, you know, count me as a doubter. Europe, on the other hand, has its act together basically. And it has its act together in a way that I think will um, undermine some basic rights, or at least has the potential to undermine freedom of expression. So one is the right to erasure or right to be forgotten that was adopted by um, the European Court of Justice just a few years ago. And let's, let's like put aside the debate over whether an individual should have that right. 
to be forgotten. I, mean, I, I think that it's actually a pretty interesting debate and there's no clear answer around that. Here's my concern. If you look in the center of this, Google says, this is when you, know, you report to Google that you want, to be you want a link delisted. They say, we will balance the privacy rights of the individual with the public's interest to know and the right to distribute information. This sounds a lot like what courts do. And yet, as with other areas of law in Europe, we're seeing European institutions essentially outsourcing to private actors the regulation of content. Do we actually, is there like a Supreme Court reporter for all of the takedown requests of, of Google um, and all of its decisions? Is there some database that gives us a sense of precedent and how the companies will act in the future? This, and this isn't the only space in which European either governments or the European Commission um, is focused, right? Because the, um, Germany just adopted a law that came into effect uh, at October 1st, I think, which essentially puts liability on the companies to remove content that's inconsistent with German law, right? So we're seeing, I think, a crack in the foundation of uh, the, the regime of intermedi intermediary liability, or the idea that the platform shouldn't be liable for the content of, uh, of third parties on their platforms, right? So this is, I think, really the first um, major uh, state law in Europe that will start to undermine the principles of intermediary liability and at the same time put on the companies the obligation to remove unlawful content. And of course, if you're facing the fines that are imposed under this law, the obvious incentive is to take down more content, to err on the side of removal and not on the side of, uh, of the fine. So I think there's a lot happening in Europe, and we should in some ways be more focused on the trends in Europe even than we are on the trends in the United States. Okay, so I think at this point, you know, it's very easy to, uh, to imagine, like the Rembrandt uh, painting from before, that this is, this is a real mess. It is a real mess. I think that censorship is, um, is rampant. And this, I think these slides... And this talk just is, is kind of the tip of the iceberg um, in a way. There is so much more happening, and there's so many individuals around the world who are being criminalized for their posts on, on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, vContact if you're in, in Russian-speaking space or if you're on WeChat somewhere else, right? There's just a whole lot of criminalization of expression around the world. So, um, so it's very easy to throw up our hands and say, particularly in an environment where I think, frankly, we can't rely on the United States as much to be a champion of freedom of expression around the world, um, that we have to think, well, what, what can be done about this? So I'll just offer a few ways forward and then, and then close. Um, that was supposed to come down a little less in once, okay. So, um, so one is for um, for private companies for technology thinking first and foremost about the overarching question of the legal environment. What are the rules that should be applying? I think that the companies would do well to think about rules that protect individual users' rights. I think they speak that language, and I think even some of the content regulation or moderation that the private platforms are. Um, are developing and imposing also to a certain extent protect individuals' rights, right? It protects the space. The more harassment and abuse there is on the platforms, you know, the more vulnerable people will be actually encouraged not to participate in those platforms. So it's not just a simple question of ensuring that they're not taking down any content. It's finding that line in which they can actually, I think, apply human rights laws standards, even if they don't do it as a matter of obligation, uh, where they can justify taking down content or justify their policies on grounds that really fit into Article 19. As it stands now, much of the content regulation 
that we see is, is kind of bilaterally influenced, meaning if you go, if, if Turkey is putting pressure on you, you'll take down content. Would you take down that same kind of content in another country where you don't get that pressure? Maybe not. So the rules are looking pretty fluid from state to state. And I think having a general set of rules that applies across the board would serve individual users, but also serve the companies as a, as a form of protection. I think there needs to be a lot of thinking about user autonomy and control. I think companies are moving towards that and, and speaking about that a lot more. But it can't just be autonomy and control. It also has to be education about those tools. They need to be user friendly because they're sometimes just hard to access right now. Transparency, it's, it's kind of a mantra. At a certain level, it sounds meaningless. But what it really means is the companies need to be clear about the standards for taking down content. But even more than that, I think they need to be clear about the cases, the examples of content takedowns, right? We need to know more because they're essentially not just making rules, but they're adjudicating. We need to know more about what that adjudication looks like. And then finally, I think that unless the industry as a whole, and I know that's hard to think about the industry as a whole because the companies don't always think of themselves in the same industry, but to the extent you're a company that is uh, regulating content or moderating content, I think it's important to start thinking about self-regulation as an industry. Not just self-regulation company by company, but start finding ways almost um, as we think about press councils around the world, which is you know, a form of press regulation that doesn't involve governments. Um, in many parts of the democratic world and, and in the developing world, I think we should start thinking about ways in which the companies can regulate uh, themselves and do so in a way that's open and transparent um, and avoids government regulation um, because I think government regulation is almost always resulting in overregulation. So if we're thinking about states and the regulatory environment, I think one key key thing is for us to continue to, um, to advocate against intermediary liability. I think it's, it's pretty clear that the fact that, uh, that companies, um, whether we're talking about startups or the big you know, behemoths of today, that, that they weren't and aren't held liable for content on their platforms has been part of the engine for innovation and also part of the engine for activism around the world. And too often, when they're put in a position of, of liability, um, it actually falls hardest on those who don't have other platforms uh, to share information, to protest, to criticize, and so forth. I think the states, governments need to create, maintain, and promote a legal environment for freedom of expression. That means all of these places where there are laws that are applicable in offline space, but also online, that redefine journalism as terrorism, that undermine the sharing of information and so forth, those need to be repealed. And we could go further and talk about things like anti-blasphemy laws. I mean, there's a very long list in which the space um, and legal framework for freedom of expression needs to be improved state by state. I think there needs to be a recommitment to basic rule of law principles. So I think it's basically inappropriate for governments to be saying to the companies, you figure out what's on the lawful side and what's on the unlawful side. I think certainly this is something for courts to continue to have a role in. And the more we outsource this or governments outsource this to companies, the less we'll know about what kind of expression is legitimate and what's illegitimate. And then finally, states could think about ways, and some of this is actually in the German law that I mentioned before, the Nets DG law, think of ways to push companies toward more transparency, toward public reporting, if we think almost similar to SEC kind of reporting requirements. There could be more information that is required of companies to be transparent, but without the hammer of liability. Um, how that actually operates, um, you know, something we could be thinking about, but these are ideas for us to start working through, I think. And I don't, as I said, um, maybe that, again, the, the Rembrandt at the beginning, 
hopefully the message there is I don't have the answers, but the situation is grim out there, and we need to, I think, recommit to the basic principles of human rights law, which is to protect everyone's right to freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, and to ensure that that protection isn't just what governments provide, but what companies provide also. I'll stop there. Totally happy to take any questions, criticisms, you name it. Thank you. We have uh, mic, three mics in the room, um, one here, one over there, and then this sweet orange cube here. Um, got one right over there. You can throw it. Oh. Oh. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. What role do you see for ISPs, like one level down from the actual content <clears throat> platform role, where there's tensions between on the one hand, being sort of a dumb pipe that's just supposed to be doing throughput, and on the other hand, potentially a role there in upholding freedom of expression, given that that's how you turn off the internet, is by leaning on ISPs, not yeah. on platforms. Yeah, it's a really great question. So actually, my last report to the Human Rights Council focused on what we called the digital access industry, which is basically infrastructure. And I mean, around the world, in a way, it's a lot harder for telcos and ISPs to push back, whether it's in the context of, you know, filtering or blocking or you know entirely taking down content, right? Um, they're in a hard position because they're under licenses in a way that most of the platforms aren't. So it's really difficult. I think there are a few things that ISPs and I rope in telcos and and also footnote the clear distinction between like you know content providers and telcos and ISPs like that's blurring a lot now right because the industries are um, are getting into each other's space um, pretty pretty regularly now but I think one one thing is um, real clear uh, transparency to their users about when they share information so when they share user information with the state so that individuals can actually know when they go online, particularly if we're thinking about surveillance, um, that you know one of my risks is that this ISP could share the information with the state. I think there should be more pushback you know, um, by ISPs and telcos when they face um, demands for shutdowns or filtering. That's really hard. So it's hard for them to say no, again, because of licensing and, and domestic regulatory rules. Um, but you know, there's a lot of foot dragging and questions that, that they could be asking of governments when there are demands for user data and when there are demands for, for filtering and so forth. So they clearly have a role to play in this space. I think they're in a harder position, but they, there are some steps. I mean, those are just two that I think they should be doing more than they're doing now. You want me to, I can just point people if you want, yeah. <laughs> Share that, yeah. Definitely. Um, what do you think about the sort of, for lack of a better term, conflict of laws question? So you talk about getting more, getting the courts into the system more, um, but that also then asks the question of, of which courts, and if the ISP is going to accept a, a court order from the United States, do they accept one from France, do they accept one from China, Russia, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, um, and and which ones? Given that those those uh, laws can not only be very different, but sometimes mutually exclusive. My yeah. favorite agreement is is the map um, between Pakistan and India, um, where where they can have completely different laws that require you to do you to do the opposite thing, yeah. um, and and then still leave stuck with the uh, content provider almost having to make a moral question about which laws they follow. Um, and is the moral opinion of accept the United States or accept France different than not accept this particular law in India? Right. Um, and how do we deal with that, sort of given your context of, the, of getting courts more involved? Yeah. I and mean, it's a really good question. I wish that we didn't have time for, <laughs> for answering it. No, I, I mean, I think... <laughs> So, I mean, two, two things. So one is that um, 
So I think that the role of the courts in particular is important, maybe to step back a little bit, because um, it's important for the companies, I think, to respond in principle when it comes to takedown requests only to you know, court orders or other you know, legitimate, say, administrative orders of the state. I think there needs to be some process so that the companies are not in the position of, you know, they get a call from a security official and says, we want you to take down this content. I, I mean, I think I'm just more comfortable and I think the companies are more comfortable, that's my guess, if, they, if it comes through judicial channels. So that's sort of at the level of principle. The second layer down is like, what should those rules be based on? And I think, again, this heads into maybe a little bit of an ideal perspective, but those uh, court judgments in those cases and orders should be based on human rights law, right? And so that should be the standard you know, across, across the board. And I don't think that the companies are in much of a position to say no if they get you know, a, um, a legitimate court order from a state to take down the content. I, I mean, I, I think that if it goes through regular process, it's, it's simply very hard to say no. Now, that leads to the fundamental problem that you mentioned, and, and it comes up in a bunch of different ways, right? It could come up in law enforcement contexts, uh, and there's actually uh, an effort, which you might be familiar with, the Internet Jurisdiction Project, which is seeking to answer and maybe even create a kind of structure for, particularly for law enforcement requests to make sure that law enforcement requests for the takedown of content are consistent around the world. And so there isn't the possibility for this kind of um, position where if I do this in compliance with your law, I'm in non-compliance with this other law. So there is, there is some thinking around that. Basically, I think that the, the companies if, um, if they have a legitimate court order, this isn't going to be a very satisfactory answer right now, and I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think I have another answer for it, but if they have a legitimate court order to take down content, I don't think they have much of a choice to do it, at least in the context of the jurisdiction where the, where the court order comes from. So it's like a geolocated kind of takedown. Now, what we're, what we're headed to, I think, is the real hard case, which is, um, which we, you know, is going to be decided probably next year in Europe, where France, in the right to be forgotten context, is saying, um, you know, we want you, Google, to take down content, not only in France, but globally. So we want global delisting. And the natural result of that is going to be conflicts of laws around the world. So I, I actually don't have a really good answer to that conflicts question. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think global de delisting is, is really problematic. Like it's, it's one thing to talk about delisting according to a particular jurisdiction, but for any government to say this should apply globally is going to lead exactly to those problems, in addition to other problems of, of freedom of expression. So. I know I'm not really getting to the core of the question, but that's, that's essentially where my thinking is right now. There was a hand up here. Easier question? Um, so I was curious, I've, I've heard at several um, conferences recently, people talking about agents, about um, Silicon Valley companies being treated like common carriers. Um, like a utility like Con Ed or something like that and potentially regulating them um, as such and treating them as an agency. So I'm curious, so it's, this is actually a two-part question, so it's hard in that way. Um, so I, I want to hear your, it's not an international um, law question, but I am curious on hearing your input on that um, subject. And then subsequently, um, it seems like from what you've been saying, you're more comfortable actually with government regulating speech than you are with private companies to a certain extent. And I'm just sort of curious like whether um, you're, you're more concerned today with tech companies than you are with government regulation to a certain extent when it comes with online speech. Mm. So I'll answer the second question first. So yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm more comfortable 
with state regulation. I, I, as, as I said, I think almost all state regulation results in overregulation. What, what I would like to see is, um, is there to be more judicial process. So I mean, real judicial process around the takedown of content. Rather, now, at least where there are complaints about illegitimate takedowns of content, right? I mean, there's, of course, going to be rules around some of the most kind of manifestly unlawful content that, that companies should take down, you know, if we're talking about child explo exploitation, for example. Um, but I do think courts should be in the position, rather than companies, when it comes to imposing some of the harshest uh, kinds of penalties. Um, otherwise, we lose a sense of you know, the public sphere being regulated by, by rule of law, basically. Um, so that's where I come to. It's not really just that governments are better. I don't think they are. But, but I do think the courts need, need to be involved. So on the question of, of common carrier treating um, you know, some internet companies as utilities, um, I, you know, I haven't gone that far to think through all of the different ramifications of that. But I would put it into two different contexts where freedom of expression is really relevant to that question. And so one is uh, network neutrality and zero rating, where I think that, that the companies, you know, particularly telcos, um, are, are really providing, they are very much like utilities in that space. And I'm really concerned, particularly about <clears throat> the FCC's proposed rule changes around network neutrality, because you know, that will lead, I think, to basically the prioritization of, um, of media and, and the prioritization of, of basically content that can, be, that can pay for it. And so I think that you know, in that sense, certainly telcos and ISPs have a public utility kind of role in this context and should be treated, treated that way. Oh, am I in my hand? I'm pointing. So yes, Eileen. Thanks, Susan. Um, so I'm going to go back to you said you really want to root things in human rights law. And when you started with Article 19, you went through you know paragraph one, paragraph two. And you said oh, I like to skip over paragraph three to the extent I can. And my background is as a media lawyer, and I think there really is a clash of values between some of the privacy stuff, certainly in Europe, and where I come from and probably the one place where I buy into American exceptionalism on the freedom of expression side coming from a media law background. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you look at Article 19, do you find in human rights law a basis for the right to erasure um, because of that third paragraph? How do you, how do you weigh that? Mm -hmm. Well, so Article 19.3, you know, one of the grounds for restricting expression is you know where it's necessary to protect the rights or reputations of others. So um, I, that's where, if I were you know lawyering for the right to be forgotten as a matter of Article 19, that's where I would. That's where you find it, right? You don't have to go to Article 17, which provides a right to privacy, in order to get there. I mean, it's 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 not like there's a necessary or built-in clash within Article 19 between expression and privacy. It allows for that kind of restriction. I think my concern, I mean, two, two separate concerns. So one is on the necessity front, right? There are other ways, and remember, right to be forgotten isn't about taking down content by the, you know, the media company itself. It's a delisting. So if you're a data processor, like Google was found to be, you need to take down the content. I think that um, I think one of the problems is a necessity. There are other ways for individuals to uh, to protect their reputation or um, or other rights, rights to privacy, even in the context of continued listing of a particular issue. And we could talk about what those might be like. But some of those ideas we're seeing 
in kind of a di in the disinformation and fake news sense, like some of those ideas are portable to right to be forgotten kinds of issues as well. I think the other problem is the proportionality um, of taking of delisting content around this, um, and in many of the cases that we've seen reported about where individuals are seeking delisting, it seems disproportionate to the impact that the actual, the continued listing actually has on their rights or reputations. So, I mean, I, I think you can argue within the context of Article 19, you know, for a right to be forgotten, but also I think there's a clear case to demand that restrictions, and I would call this a restriction on expression, need to meet these necessity and proportionality standards that they don't necessarily meet. Um, so that's how I would get to it here. I mean, I think the right to be forgotten, just a, a broader point on the right to be forgotten, is in individual cases, it may not look so terrible. Um, the problem is in the aggregate, the taking down or the delisting of, you know, quite a bit of information that might be useful for like a historical picture of a particular place or for researchers to be able to study trends in particular areas. So I think it's really important to think of it from stepping back. And when you think of the tens of thousands of requests for delisting, which tend to focus on you know, the relevance of information in a continuing way, I think we're losing that broader picture, even if you could make the case for an individual's right in a particular case. Uh, hi, I'm Aviv Avadia. Um, I'm uh, a, a director of project at the Center for Social Media Responsibility, which is just formed out of Ann Arbor, among, among other things. And I guess I wanted to ask you about things that were not quite takedowns or delistings. So things like um, the autoplays that show up after you watch a YouTube video, or the ranking in, in a news feed, or, the, um, uh, or, or in search, I guess. Uh, so it's not, it's not a, a delisting. And I apologize if you already covered this to some extent, because I was actually talking to someone at Twitter about these issues and at the meeting that night. Oh. <laughs> so, what did they say? Um, well, we were talking. <laughs> I'm just. I, we, we, I mean, we, we're talking about sort of the misinformation and sort of the ways to address that, which is sort of um, in a way that, that, that doesn't lead to censorship, does yeah. protect free expression, mm -hmm. but there is, there is sort of this, um, this gray line around these things. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I guess that that's one set of questions. So, how do you deal with these things that aren't, that aren't black and white? And the other thing is, what about the other. The other side of this right to be forgotten, do um, Russian t Twitter disinformation trolls have a right to be forgotten? Um, as in like, which is, the, and that is, the, that is actually a major problem in the space is that they don't exist on the internet anymore. There might be some people who have cached the data. They can't even say that they have it because if they do, then they violated Twitter's terms of service and mm -hmm. then they get booted and they no longer get any Twitter data. Mm -hmm. They can't do any more research in the space. So I guess those are the, the two sides of that coin in that. Okay. I'm not sure I understand the second one quite as much so, so the, the as second, the first. So the second one is, <clears throat> is like, right to be forgotten means that you have to take down that content um, a, a, after, if, if there's a request to do so. Is that, mm -hmm. is that my understanding? That's my understanding of that to some extent. Um, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's one version of it. I mean, basically, it's a delisting. Sure. A delinking. Um, it's not... It, it, so you're saying it's not an expunging from the internet permanently or from all private databases? I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, what you're going to go to, you know, El País and do the, you know, go to the microfiche and, I mean, <laughs> that people don't, people probably don't even know what microfiche well, is I, anymore. I, 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 I guess the reason I brought it up is because the, the argument that, that Twitter might make, yeah. um, and this is, this is just, you know, the public policy statement is like, yeah. well, if a tweet is deleted, then any p person who has that tweet mm. stored locally from their feed must delete that tweet and mm. so that means that if I am a Twitter troll and I, you know, spread some disinformation campaign and then yeah. I delete my account <clears throat> two weeks later, that is expunged from all traces online, period, and offline, in theory. Mm. And that, that is it, would it stay in the Wayback Machine, for example? No, I, I no, no, no. The, the, the whole point of this is that they don't allow their policy is actually to remove it completely. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's to protect these exact values. Yeah. Of like, so if you want to delete something from Twitter, then it's gone. Yeah. So let me let me just get at the at sure. the first one more than the second one maybe. But um, I actually think there's a lot of things that companies uh, can be doing in this space that's short of like if we're talking about misinformation on in the first side, that's um, that's short of kind of a heavy-handed censorship right. of of information and. 
I actually, I, I sort of, I'll take at face value the statements that most of the companies have been making that they that they see it's something to solve. I mean, yeah, for that, these purposes, that's, that's and you know, there have been some interesting ideas out there. Um, you know, that go to providing people with more information about about URLs, about sources of information, around flagging. I mean, I think there are some interesting things out there that that will at least, you know, hopefully not give too many excuses to governments to start actually criminalizing in this space. So, um, you know, and I think those ideas are out there and a lot of people are talking about them, so I won't go through yeah, through them, go, go through through them here. I mean, I think, I mean, maybe to get at your, your second question in a little bit of a, you know, roundabout way, I think that one of the problems with the right to be forgotten is that it is... <laughs> it's kind of infecting a lot of thinking about, um, you know, different contexts of our own personal information, especially information that is truthful about us that's online beyond the context in which it arose in, um, you know, in, in Google Spain, right, in the 2014 case before, before the European Court of Justice. So I think that it's becoming more and more common to think that, well, if this information is just irrelevant or, you know, it doesn't reflect me anymore for whatever reason, that there's a right to take that down, that I own information about myself, as if every person, you know, is a, an, a B-list celebrity who gets to, uh, you know, litigate their image. I mean, that's just, I don't think that's, that's plausible. So, you know, when, when we're talking about you know the kind of situation you're you're talking about for Twitter. I, it's a problem for Twitter, but I I don't think they should go down the road of once information is up, they should you know taking it down. I think that's that's a problem. But I'm not sure I'm totally getting. And we could talk afterwards about sure. like the direction that you're heading in, in your question. Sure. Yeah. Hadar. Yeah. You've got well, the, I have the box. Well, yeah. The box is the, pretty the cool. Cube. Yeah. Cube. I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the intersection of the Ruggie principles on business and human rights and the guiding principles on, on business and human rights and the emergence, the very slow, slow drip drip emergence mm -hmm. of you know, some kind of format for a treaty and how that may be intersecting or not intersecting around self-regulation and all of the things that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or so not. for people who aren't familiar with it. So the, the Ruggie principles are the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights. And in fact, the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years on, you know, thinking about the private sector in, in the digital age is kind of on the foundation of the Ruggie principles, which on the one hand, assume that human rights law doesn't apply directly to companies, but also um, I think makes a pretty good case that in particular sectors of our economies, companies stand in between governments and individuals and have the potential and even the responsibility to respect the rights that those people enjoy. And so I think a lot of our work, again, goes back to the way Article 19 is framed, which is everyone enjoys these rights. And so in part in thinking about these rights, it's important to think, are, are companies doing things that interfere with those rights? Um, are they doing things that make it harder for individuals to enjoy those rights? Whether in the context of government-imposed restrictions or in the context of their own terms of service and community standards. I, I mean, I think that's one way to think of it. What those don't answer is whether, you know, the platforms have space that we should think about as public space. Um, and I mean, I think that's kind of a fundamental question because the more, and there's some variation from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, you know, in some places there actually is competition among different places where you can express yourself. In others, like in Myanmar, you know, it's Facebook or nothing. So that's the place to express yourself if you're in digital space. So I think there's some, like that, that's a kind of a fundamental question as well. Do yeah. you see that as the conduit? You know, could that be one of the conduits, though, into trying to find some sort of a framework? 
Or does the framework sort of need to get invented among, yeah. the, among the companies themselves? No, I would say that the companies can draw upon both you know, the Ruggy principles, but the way the Ruggy principles are bringing in things like Article 19. Right. And they could construct rules around, around those rules. Yeah. So maybe one more question. If there, yeah. I want to ask a question that kind of gets at um, what we talked about with um, the hate, hate speech and, and um, I guess incentivizing people to violence. So the internet is incredibly powerful due to anonymity, but then the paradox of that is there's lack of accountability yeah. for those words. And you may say something and that will mobilize people to go overboard to what you originally intended. And maybe someone could get hurt. Like, uh, I, just, I just want to see um, what your opinion was on, um, on, on accountability. Yeah, I mean, you've hit on a real, I think a hard problem for advocates of anonymity, and I'm an advocate for, for anonymity online. I mean, I think, that first off, there are things that companies can be doing to provide more tools for, for users who are the subject of hate when it's kind of a targeted kind of hate. Um, you know, some of that is, is blocking. Um, some of it is more extensive um, you know, group blocking that some of the companies are doing, but it's not that easy to do all the time. So I think there are steps that can be taken. But I also think that actually human rights law provides a way of thinking through these things and that companies can, can actually benefit from, from using human rights law to think through how to, to deal with problems of anonymity or anonymous hatred or anonymous incitement to violence in anonymous abuse on their platforms. And, and I think the way they could think through that is, right, Article 19 says if it's, you know, provided in their rules, let's say, and it's necessary and proportionate to restrict that kind of expression in that context, you know, and they make that kind of analysis, I think that's, that's fair for them to do, and they, they should be doing that. Now, does it mean, I mean, one of the problems with sort of the, the proliferation on some platforms of anonymous accounts is it becomes a little bit like whack-a-mole. And, and it becomes very hard to hold any particular account holder or account um, accountable for, for that kind of abuse. Um, and it's hard to stop because of that kind of proliferation. And I don't, I mean, I think there are some tools and technology to track uh, those th that proliferation, which we see used in the counterterrorism space, and probably can be applied more in the in this kind of context uh, as well. But I think there are a lot of tools that that companies um, can use again that are rooted in law, even if they're not saying again that they're bound by law to do X, Y, or Z. But they're rooted in law, so they they have a a kind of um, semblance of legitimacy in, in human rights law. I think that there, there are things they, they can do. But, I mean, I'm saying that and it sounds very easy because I'm up here and I'm not actually working through the technology or designing it. I don't think it's easy. I mean, I, on a lot of these issues, I, I don't want to give the impression that I think it's like snap your fingers and, you know, you get rid of hate, you, you get, you find accountability and all of, I don't think they're, I don't think they're easy. I mean, that's in a way why, you know, Rembrandt's old man has his hand on his head. You know, it's, I, it's, these are really hard questions, I think. Yeah, if I just do a quick follow-up. I mean, there was this um, incident earlier in the year where I think it was like the editor of an alt-right, you know, online um, news media. Maybe it was like his grandmother had some, uh, his mother had a uh, dispute with a Jewish, uh, Jewish person over a piece of property. And he used his, um, alt-right platform to mobilize a lot of a lot of uh, hateful online trolls and the yeah. result was a lot of malicious personal phone calls to uh, that that Jewish woman's um, cell right. phone to I mean it's, it's a it's a terrifying weapon I mean, it's a yeah. par powerful uh, ter terror weapon is is um, I, what we've what, uh, are continuing to learn yeah no so I agree with that and I mean I don't think we should imagine that digital space is jurisdiction free. So like in a, in a case like that, 
which sounds, I don't know that particular case, but it sounds like it's getting pretty close to incitement to violence. I mean, that's... She tried to sue, she, her her uh, counter move was to sue that, that news organization. So there could be that, but, there, you know, governments have a responsibility to prevent violence against their citizens uh, or people in their jurisdiction. So, you know, and that, I mean, you're just giving one example. We're seeing that in, in Myanmar right now where the government is doing almost nothing to prevent the use of digital space to incite violence against Rohingya Muslims. The government should be taking action in some of these contexts. It's not that there's, you know, because it's Twitter um, or Facebook or another platform or just another media outlet like, you know, the Daily Stormer, they're not free to do what they want just because it's, it's digital space. You know, if people can be identified, and, and many times they can be, for that kind of hatred that constitutes incitement, um, it seems to me that governments should be doing their part in holding people accountable. And companies should be cooperating in those, in those cases as long as regular legal process is pursued. So I think that's, yeah, we're good. You can get a beer now. <laughs> is that you can get a beer now? Yeah. That's right. right. Please, Gary, me and I give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And please do go get another beer, grab some more snacks, and uh, feel free to hang out. See you later. Is she really? Human rights. Yes, yeah. you just oh. have to poke you. You're going to be here all.